to the Grim Chronicles. This is going to be my weekly reading update for week, uh, let me just check, I think it's going to be week 11. Yes, because this we're in the 12th week and this is still Tuesday. I'm getting um, a bit late getting to the making of the video because I'm on my spring break and my whole relationship to time is sort of different. I've been kind of staying up much later than I would normally because I don't have to get up at the crack of dawn to get ready to teach at 8.30. It's funny how my whole sort of way of being changes when I'm not teaching. Um, yeah, so even in, even if it's just a week, it just seems completely different. My whole reality has changed somewhat. I mean, I'm being... I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it just seems that way. And the other thing is that I've been in the grading tunnel. So whenever I have a stack of grading, I call it the tunnel and I try and go into it. And I was pretty bad about getting distracted from grading my fairy tale papers, midterms. So it took me two days and um, it still kind of took quite a bit out of me. Yesterday I graded about well half of them and today the other half. And so, but it's done. So now I can sort of go back. I had a nice weekend and I had this two days of grading sort of, well, you know, until now. And now my spring break can start and it's going to be so exciting because I'm going to read, you know. <laughs> it's like it's so exciting that I can sit down and read a book or just read and not have to think about all the other things I need to do. And, you know, that's wonderful. Of course, you know, because I am the person that I am, I'm kind of looking forward to doing some, I don't know, I'm very strange. I like, I like uh, organizing places in my home <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll clean too, but I don't like cleaning as much, but I will do it if it really needs to be done. But what I actually really get joy out of is need of, what I call needifying. And it's kind of just um, indicative of the strange person that I am. For example, many, many years ago I worked just sort of as a grad student, sort of an extra job at, at the university library at UMass Amherst. And I actually really enjoyed shelf reading. And shelf reading is when you just go and make sure that all the books are in the right place. And of course they never were because people put them back where willy nilly, how dare they? <laughs> and so I would love to sort of, you know, the Dewey Decimal System and I were like, I, if that's what it is, is this the Dewey Decimal, the one, the the one with the letters and the numbers? I'm not sure about that, but I think it is. Anyway, I love putting like, I love it when I found something that was not in the right place, taking it out and putting it in the right place, and also putting all the books that were on the sort of in the little study areas, just put needifying, putting them back. I just really like doing that, <laughs> which is, you know, I'm always, actually, that's one thing I, I also want to do is want to call these books a little bit better and um, take out the ones that I'm not no longer interested in reading, or at least not now. So yeah, the ones in front are less, or the ones that I'm less interested in having on the special shelves in my room. So let me get to the book that I finished finally, which was this one, which I should have finished a long time ago, The Letter left to me from Joseph McElroy, which he published, which was published in 88, but does take place quite a bit earlier in the 40s. And I think it is kind of connected to his own life, which is something I should have checked, but I didn't. So is it, is it autofiction? Does it have an autobiographical? Um, not sure. They don't say that much here about that, and it doesn't really matter because it is a novel and we'll just go with that. So, definitely five stars. Really good, really good. Um, it's it's a modernist novel, so it has a kind of different way of telling its story. It's this sort of stream of consciousness. The It's not just laid out. The plot just is it's just not told in a normal, straightforward way. And I did kind of... I don't know exactly why, but it did kind of remind me of Uvianzon's style in Anniversaries, even though that was written earlier in the 60s, I think, or 60s and 70s. But um, I called it oblique because it's as if what's fun about a, this kind of book is that you have the story, so the plot elements, and then you have the fact that it's told in this interesting way, so you don't kind of 
get the story sort of served to you on a platter. You have to discern it, but it's not that hard to do. Um, you kind of sort of get glimpses of the plot sort of through um, the the glimpse. I don't know. It's, it's hard to describe what I'm getting at. And I just have a few notes here. I don't know if they make much sense, but so basically it's all a, a, the sort of what the center of the novel is this letter. And I was sort of thinking about other novels that contain or are about letters. Of course, you have epistolary novels, which is a different thing. This is not an epistolary novel. This is a novel about a letter that was left to him by his father that his mother gives to him pretty soon after his father dies. And uh, the father died fairly suddenly um, uh, around Christmas time. And it turns out that the letter was written some years earlier. He finds that out. And so it's almost like he's piecing together the the facts that led to the writing of the letter. And he's actually, the narrator is actually very concerned with what led him to write this letter and what was his state of mind when he wrote this letter. And it turns out it had to do with some kind of chat that he was having with a friend of his, the father. And it almost seems like a he had this chat with his friend and then he goes off and writes this letter. It's almost like it's a little bit of a one-off, like, let me quickly write this letter. And the narrative is very interesting how he sort of doesn't know how he feels about that. You can't tell if he's sort of a little bit disappointed in that or that it's not sort of completely well thought through. And I mean, one book that it did, I mean, just because of the letter aspect of it, is that if you think of the Gilead tr trilogy or what's more than, it's four books, Marilyn Robinson's um, Gilead is the father actually writing the letter to his son and he's still alive and he's watching his cute little boy play with the cat. And so this, these these letters that these parents leave to their kids and, and then this is sort of from the kid's point of view, which is interesting. Um, anyway, so, and so what I say here is, so we re, he re, so part of the novel is him remembering his father sort of distinctly from the letter. Um, he remembers, for example, how the father talked. And I have one one passage that I could read, that I might read, um, how he talked, um, his command of language. And um, the timeline is, of the story is complicated, is layered, as I wrote here. And um, so, because on the one hand, you have the present of the narrator, the, the son, and him moving forward through life and gr his grieving of his lost uh, parent. And so we move from his last days of high school through his first days of college. And um, what's interesting about this type of storytelling is you don't quite see, there's, there's sort of these leaps of suddenly he's in this place or in this space and in this time, and then suddenly he's in this space and time. And you don't quite see how he gets there, just sort of suddenly he is in these other spaces. But the the plot element that is sort of question uh, that has him questioning everything is the fact that, and I'm not sure who decided this, but the letter that was written to him slowly gets forwarded and copied and sent out to many other people. First off, the father's family, and we get a little bit of a insight into his mother's relation and his own relationship to his father's family. And I will say right off the bat that the one sort of, um, the person who we, who I kind of wanted to get a better insight into is the mother. So, you know, the widow, because I'm not sure we, we get glimpses of her, but that's about it. We don't really get a lot of her. It's really him thinking about his father. Um, and it's as if there's a whole other novel there about what she's going through, I guess. Um, so... And well, so one question I had that I would like to have had resolved, maybe it just is, is a sign I need to reread it again, is, well, how did this, who decided that this letter is worthy of being copied, you know, and, and, and sent out to other people? And first of all, it's sent out to everyone in his family, in the father's family mainly, and they kind of, this little discussion is back, well, don't you think so-and-so should have a copy of this letter? And just to speak to the letter itself, if you went in and sort of cut and paste all the little quotes from the letter you get a gist of the letter which it's semi-interesting but it but basically the gist of it is a little bit I mean it goes to the gist of it is um 
don't waste your life song. You know, get on with it um, and 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 make sure you you live up to what uh, you know the world thinks you can accomplish. Don't waste your time, sort of that kind. Because of, because I wasted mine a little bit and I let myself get um, sort of pushed off my career path or my goal or whatever it's, it's a sort of a fresh middle age i think it's even says somewhere in the, in the novel a frustrated middle-aged man's regrets so to speak and and he's sort of dumping all of this on his son but posthumously you know because he's no longer around and it is a lot to you know his son's 15 at the outset and he gets this letter <laughs> what's he's and and he does sort of kind of ask himself well, what am i supposed to do with this i'm 15 you know uh, and a lot of, uh, quite a bit of the novel is taken up with him speculating about his own father's life, especially sort of what, well, what was the father doing when he was younger? And, and so he looks around and thinks, well, that could be my father or, you know, like, um, how was he as a young person? And he, you get a little bit of the story of how he, his life, the father's life. Um, but it really sort of stays pretty, pretty much, I mean, the whole novel is really inside the consciousness of this young fellow. And the writing is really, really strong, uh, but in a kind of unobtrusive, un no, sort of not ostentatious way, which is really good. I mean, yeah, no, it's it's an excellent sort of examination of um, grief and how we how people relate to their parents and and sort of the subtle. Mm, grievances we might have with our families it's not nothing is it's not sort of sensationalistic at all it's more sort of subtle the ending is kind of strange because it's so good because it, he has sort of a mm, a bit of a meltdown at the at the school because yeah the plot at the level of plot what happens and it's pretty outrageous if you ask me is that someone decided that this level letter is so wonderful that it gets Xerox or copied and sent out to all the freshmen at this kid's college with a letter from the dean and the kid cannot bear this and he he sort of stalks the post office and he's and he's kind of obsessively looking at people reading this letter and getting their reactions to it and that's his breakdown at the end a little bit so he he follows people around and looks in the waste bus because he's looking for this letter and at the end he's like walking through the dorms and just going into people's rooms looking for this letter because he knows it's been sent to everyone and you kind of are with him because it's like how, how why <laughs> and you know i mean he's too young but did he have no say in the matter it was a letter left to him so i mean i think that's why we have this novel <laughs> sort of it's like his anger at at the situation or this is sort of kind of what's going on here so let me see if i if it's worth reading this paragraph so this is just a little snippet of the style that this novel is in um, towards the end and it's him talking and and so what I'm getting at with the style is how it sort of there are, there are jump cuts like it it just sort of is thought upon thought upon thought like it, it it's not uh, his thoughts as most of our thoughts probably are not sort of a smooth narrative we we jump back and forth in our in our heads okay so here's a little paragraph my father was held to have a command of language his talk survives in our memory he punned he talked history he says, Joe Lewis is more than human, but not just a machine. My father predicts the round. Or we're at a ball game in the upper deck, staring down at Dixie Walker, and my father says, he's due for a hit. My father knew French. He loves sports, but hasn't the time. He listens so carefully, if only he could be present to hear his lawyer friend, who was once at Oxford, telling me in, the, in great eloquent detail how right he thought my father's letter was. My father spoke Latin at a party he and my mother went to. He quoted poetry. So even in that short paragraph, you see the sort of interweaving of the different layers and his anger. There's a lot of anger there, you know, teenage anger and frustration and kind of the frustration that comes from not being able to speak your piece and interact with the, the people. And, and, and part of why he cannot do that is that he is still grieving, that he's sort of paralyzed a little bit so um highly recommend as, as, and it was my first foray and won't be my last with joseph McElroy, who i know has 
most of the other ones are quite a bit longer than this so we'll see but i'm really glad i read it so that's that um still slowly moving through my big fantasy novel the the main character this this terrible monster of a fellow is kind of having more and more of a comeuppance and being forced into situations where he has to sort of contend with the fact that he was a monster before it's almost like it's a whole thing of karma and um but that's what makes it his character interesting is that he is dealing with that and realizing um that how he was is no longer going to be will not serve him he won't able to be how he was before even though he's it's it's hot you know you can't just shake it off and other people are coming into play of course other other storylines but um still really good and i'm trying to think if there's anything i need to say about oh what's interesting about the series i mean is that it's, it's a series so i'm in chapter four or five of this fourth book is it the, I think it's the fourth book of the series. Yes. And so, well, no, maybe. Yeah, no, it's the fourth book. And so we're, I'm finding out stuff that I'm, it sort of goes back to a lot of stuff that happened in book two. Because book three, as I recall, was stuff that happened to the, to a different group of people at the same time time as, as, as stuff happened in book two and now we're getting back to the same people as in book two but we're kind of coming back to them or f getting more of the the story but from a different angle different perspective and so this there's one family where all the the children play important roles Perrin and his two sisters and i think this book will focus on the one sister that we haven't focused on because book two was a lot about his sister Book one he was in, and then in book three he was in quite a bit, Perrin. And now, so we're going to find out about his sister, I think that's Tavore, adjunct Tavore. Still highly recommend it if you're into the, you know, epic, well, well done high fantasy that um, even has some humor. There is There are some funny bits, and it's not sort of irony or anything it's it's pretty much high fantasy but it's well done so that's that uh have not had time to get back into miss mackinger's my darling but you know what maybe tomorrow for the first time in a very long while i'm still uh doing my 10 pages a day of angel in the forest which is still really really good it's lost a little bit of its luster just because you know how can it's it, it's hard to, for it to be we've moved on from rap the german person who had the new harmony into Owen and so Owen is slowly making his way over into new harmony and he's at, we actually are there with um, parts of his family but what I'm a little bit um, at a loss of is we're not getting a lot of him there so apparently what happened and I'm a little surprised but maybe I shouldn't be is that when Owen bought new harmony he bought the whole village from Rab he doesn't seem to, he seems to sort of just kind of like invited everyone to come over, you know, come over to my little village that I'm going to start a utopian community in. And of course, he does that and a lot of, for lack of a better term, riffraff show up. <laughs> and it's all kind of chaotic and there doesn't seem to be a lot of rhyme or reason. Uh, and part of it is that he had to stay in England a bit longer. I'm trying to remember why. So he's stuck in England and then he comes over and then there's this strange time where they get stuck on the river in ice. So they can't go, he's still not at New Harmony. And meanwhile, the people left in charge of New Harmony are not doing a great job. And it's all kind of a bit sort of haphazard and, and not what you expect from, from a, you know, utopian community where everyone uh, kind of has to do, do their, play their part for it to even work mildly. And I'm wondering if he'll come into play and then make it work for a little while, or if it's just going to, fizzle out straight away which i know it will i mean that's it's not a surprise that it will so yeah he, he, the stuff about him in england almost was a bit more interesting because he was so he's such an interesting crazy fellow and now that he's left the left the stage it's like well i kind of miss him a little bit but he'll come back and it's still very very good i mean it's still an amazing uh non-fiction depiction of this um utopian communities town 
And what's interesting is that sometimes I feel sort of compelled to go check up on whether what she's saying, you know, actually happened. And most of the time when I do that, it, 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 the facts of uh, what she says they are, it's just that they're couched in sort of such a poetic manner that you kind of almost doubt it. Like, is she making this stuff up? So she had this one um, passage where someone came into a, a bar and he's sort of dressed up in really strange clothing. I forget who it was page something and he sort of says some ex there are a lot of eccentric types and the little bit of the big novel that i've read of hers is all about eccentric types it sort of thrives on eccentric types in a way um the the opium mother and even well the narrator is sort of observing everyone else being eccentric and is you know probably themselves also so yeah the status of eccentricity is and so that's because i'm used to i mean that's I see that in the novel, I'm kind of like, well, when I encounter that in the non-novel, I'm like, is she, is she just adding a little bit here? <laughs> is she embellishing? Which, I mean, I'm sure she kind of is, but she seems to be able to embellish in a way that's still true to the people, and, and she gets her facts right, so she's not really, you know, she's not making stuff up here. She, she really is just in, infusing the whole um, sort of what happened there with her own with her own magic which is in a way is kind of wonderful and and it it fits to do that with a place like new harmony which is a such such a strange place that had was able to entice these two people to to come there so uh it's perfect per perfection and what else so uh in terms of other things i'm going to be reading well first i have a little bit of a i know i'm already at 21 minutes so i'll, I'll try and hurry up here so because it looks like I'm, I really will be going to Germany in May, despite whatever happens with the world, I, I am intent, I, you know, I have booked my Airbnbs and my hotel, so I am going. So of course I'm sort of obsessive that I am, you know, thinking way too much about what I'm going to take and luggage and clothing, whatever, but also books. And, you know, in this day and age, you don't take books, you take your electronic device. And I'm sort of, humming and hawing it a lot too. I've kind of decided I don't think I want to take my iPad because I have been talked into um, taking my laptop. There's no way I can't. As my sister said, but you're going for work. You need your laptop. And she's completely right. How, how could I even think that I could do it without my laptop? So I'll take my laptop for work. But then for reading, I have, I mean, am, am I the only one? I'm sure I'm not. Do we not all have graveyards of kindles etc in our in our spaces in our homes and so we certainly do and so the two that so since i'm kind of not that into taking my ipad which is too bad because you know it's the newest and has the most stuff on it but it's too big i think it's it's not even that big but i, I just want something that's more as we say in german handlich this is not handlich i mean it's pretty handlich but I want something little and and since i have old kindles so i'll show you the two that i have i have this i think it's an early version of a paper white so this one here that's what it looks like in its cover and then this is even older but even tinier but actually a little bit heavier this is probably not going to go but i do like that it's so tiny this is so this is an old fire that i juiced up again but that won't let me into certain apps because it's sort of saying this is too old. It, it, it won't even do Google stuff because it's saying this is too old. I'm not sure how old it is, but I just kind of love how tiny it is. But the thing is, it is a full, I mean, just, it doesn't, it's not like a, a computer, but it does have, you know, it has, you know, apps and stuff. But so I probably won't oh, see it's like license limit reached and you can't do this device not registered. So I've kind of, already I had I, I had sort of thrown this one away more or less and decided to reboot it just because I was in, entranced by its tininess a little fire so probably what I probably should do is just go with this one right right <laughs> and of course I'm already kind of downloading stuff and so the person that I'll probably start a new project on I'm all in I'm all about the projects this year 2022 the year of starting projects so I have project Margaret Young and the new person I'm, uh, and I had the project of what was his name, Karl May that I you know, 
needed an intervention for. <laughs> but this person, I don't think I'll need an intervention for because he's actually really interesting. It's a German writer born yesterday in 1763, so 21st of March. Johann Paul Friedrich Richter, whose name in German is Jean Paul. He goes by Jean Paul, so Paul, like Paul McCartney. And he chose that name because of Rousseau. And he's sort of a very interesting figure that we don't really know much about in the English speaking world. He's not really part of the, the, the core romantics in Germany. And he's sort of between, uh, well, he's not really a classicist either. He is what he is. He was, he was writing towards the end of the 18th century. So he was born in 63 and he died 1825. And so he starts writing, you know, later on in the 18th century. But he, I started reading, I had, I don't know if I, where, I think I'd already downloaded one of his, he, he was known for writing sort of uh, autobiographies for one thing. And I started reading one and I thought it was really, really funny. He's really funny. Like he's a humorist. And so you kind of get, I'm looking at mildly at my Wikipedia page, you get sort of Lawrence Stern, Tristram Shandy vibes and just, and I started, so then of course, you know, being the, um, you know, apps, trying to be a perfectionist, um, I, I went and kind of got all of his works, which were 99 cents on Kindle. So now I have all of Jean Paul's works on the, this one here on all of my devices. It's a little hard because it's one of those cheap editions. So it's hard to sort of plow through and get to the headings of the actual books that I want to read because I don't think I want to read all of them. But um, and I did start reading his first novel, which is called in English. It, there is a translation called The Invisible uh, Loge in, in English would be like Lodge. Yeah, like a Freemason's Lodge, The Invisible Lodge. And apparently it's sort of a romantic tale. But even that's really funny at the beginning. It starts out with this person who's obsessed with chess and his daughter plays chess really well. And there's this funny thing about how her suitors have to beat her at chess within seven weeks. But I'm not doing justice to how funny his prose is. These really long metaphors that are just hilarious. And so Project Jean-Paul is underway. I mean, it's on my Kindle, so we'll see. And you, I'm sure most of my viewers have not heard of him at all, uh, Jean-Paul. Uh, and the only sort of English speaking connection that I could find quickly was Thomas Carlyle, another person who people don't read much these days, <laughs> Scottish cultural critic who kind of liked Jean Paul and wrote essays about Jean Paul. Uh, Carlyle was sort of a, you know, he was into the German stuff, Goethe and even the Romantics, but also Jean Paul. So, um, yeah. I'm actually not that familiar with Carlyle. I mean, I don't know if I've ever read any Carlyle, but I think his novel, Satur, something or other, is sort of connected to Jean-Paul in a way, or kind of inspired by Jean-Paul-esque type stuff. Sort of witty anecdotes. And apparently Jean-Paul, for some reason, Goethe and Schiller both didn't like him, probably just because they couldn't, you know, they were the, the big egos around. Um, but, uh, he was apparently a very funny conversationalist. People did like him. He was sort of, and, and that, one thing that I've read in his biography already is that someone with mm, quite a bit of money decided to give him, a, him a certain amount of money, a little bit like the guy who got, uh, kidnapped gave Arno Schmidt money later on, centuries later. And of course, Arno Schmidt has a story Well, his, his last novel is kind of related or has something to do with Jean Paul. I'll go back. To, I'll get back to you on that. So of course, Arno Schmidt. I, I, mean, I think Arno Schmidt was just you know German literature. He's there, so you know Karl May, Jean Paul, but but also kind of marginalized people a little bit. So yeah, that's that's that. So I'll I'll give you more on that. And so I just kind of wanted to get people's you know the whole graveyard of devices. If you have any insight into a good one to travel with, but I'm probably just going to go with my paperweight, which doesn't have anything on it except text. And it's kind of black and white. It doesn't have the, this is not a paperweight. This is a pre paperweight Kindle. So yeah, I don't know. And the final thing that I will probably get to, hopefully this will be to take place of this 
is uh, I'm going to go back to reading Hertha Müller. Gosh, I'm at 30, sec 30 minutes almost. Sorry, guys. Hertha Müller, a Nobel Prize winning writer from um, Romania, but who grew up speaking German. And I'm reading her novel, Reisende auf einem Bein, um, Traveler on One Leg, which is connected to her own life as she was able to leave um, Romania when it was still Ceausescu, Ceausescu. And her whole life has been kind of, you know, using literature as a way to express her frustrations with totalitarian regimes and kind of seems timely. And also I was just thinking about how all these poor people who have to leave these places wherever in the world, but right now Ukraine and other places, but Ukraine, um, they leave and it doesn't mean that everything is fine then. They they have left so much behind and, and then the, 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 you know, the, their country and their lives have just been completely upended. And just because they're safe, um, it's still a lot to, to work through in terms of layers of trauma, especially with the war still going on, which is just, you know, awful, awful, awful. So I kind of feel like reading Hatta Miller and her style is just so beautiful and poetic. And she has a way of, even though she writes about deep and sad and heavy topics, her style is very soothing because it's very, um, I don't know. It's very like she pays attention to her, to her words and and um, yeah, and her the sentences. One thing I was thinking about how important the sentence is for for my love of literature. Um, each sentence is important. Maybe that's where I should end it um, for this week because it's already been thirty one minutes that I've been chatting away here. I had I don't even know all the stuff I've talked about. I apologize for being this long. Hope everyone is doing well and thank you all for watching. And uh, as you can tell, I'm not quite sure how to use the community tab. So you just get pictures of Lily now and then or little updates. And because, you know, that's that's and I think that's fine or, or, you know, whatever. So, yeah, let me know what you're reading and I will talk to you next week. And I'm going to enjoy my time off until then. Bye bye.